afternoon. I'm Janet Jacobson. I'm the director of the Barnard Center for Research on Women, and I want to welcome you to this fall's conference, Justice in the Home. And then I want to give special thanks, among many other people, um, that I'm about to go through the various list of thanks to the uh, Barnard librarians, Vani Natarayan and Alik Garasi, who have put together a bibliography of resources related to the conference themes. You can see them and you can also add to the bibliography at the Justice in the Home wiki space, um, uh, which you can find on the BCRW website as well. So special thanks to the librarians who are our great allies here at Barnard College. All right. And as I said, there is a long list of people to thank um, because one of the things this conference is about is recognizing the importance of um, what our colleagues at Damayan, the Migrant Workers Association, call the work that makes all work possible. So first of all, we'd like to recognize all the work in the home and the need for justice in the home that has made us being here at this conference together possible. So thanks to all the domestic workers that make our presence here today possible. Um, I also would like to thank uh, BCRW staff members, Ann Jonas, our program manager, uh, Pamela Phillips, Nietzsche Yin, and Tammy Navarro, who have done tons of work in order to make the day run as smoothly as possible. Yes, clap for them. They're good. Then we have a number of co-sponsors, which I think shows the excitement broadly about this field of work, um, and I do want to acknowledge them now. Um, in addition to the National Domestic Workers Alliance, which of course I will talk about more in a, in very shortly, yes, NDWA. Uh, Co-sponsors include the Worker Institute at Cornell University, Labor Research and Action Network, the Murphy Institute for Worker Education and Labor Studies, the UCLA Institute for Research on Labor and Employment, the UC Santa Barbara Department of Feminist Studies, the UC Berkeley Center for Labor Research and Education, and the Roosevelt Center. I'd like to thank all of them for their support of this conference. It's truly an honor to welcome you here this evening for this opening plenary of Justice in the Home, Domestic Work, Past, Present, and Future. Um, this conference is a very special occasion. As many of you know, BCRW has long been dedicated to collaborations between research and action, and in particular to collaborative partnerships, including one with NDWA that began in 2008, which was a project in our new Feminist Solution series, and that culminated with this publication, Valuing Domestic Work, which was written by Tiffany Williams from NDWA, and Premila Nadison, who was at that time a collaborative partner scholar, but who has very thankfully since joined the Barnard faculty, we're very glad to have her here and who brought this conference to Barnard, so thanks to Premila. This was also the first time that we got to work with the wonderful Ai Jin Pu, who has been back to um, collaborate with us on a number of occasions, so we always want to thank Ai Jin. And we're particularly happy to be working with NDWA on this conference because it represents an effort um, at MDWA to create new models for the connections between research and organizing. Um, in this case, a model for domestic workers and NDWA to guide the research in this field. It has been a singular pleasure to work with NDWA's research director, Linda Burnham, who I will get a chance to introduce in a moment, although she also said I'm supposed to just say, here's Linda. Uh, <laughs> But she has been the driving force behind this conference and her vision as a researcher and activist is crucial to making sure that research that's done in this field, and in fact we think it can be a model for all fields, is relevant, meaningful to the people most effective, and effective in the world. So thanks to Linda. Clap now. We think that this conference offers a model for how to connect research and action, and in particular, we are excited to be doing this in this field of scholarship because it's a particularly important and exciting field. It includes some real trailblazers in feminist scholarship who you see arrayed before you and whom we're very happy to welcome here at BCRW. Um, and it also includes some of the newest, most innovative, and most exciting emerging scholarship in, um, that's happening today. So we're very thankful to be able to bring all these together over the next few days 
to really discuss what the past, present, and future of domestic worker organizing is. And we're also very happy to be able to incorporate domestic workers into the program as a whole. Um, so it is now my distinct pleasure to introduce to you Lydia Katina Amaya, who is a member of Damayan Migrant Workers Association. Um, I'm just gonna say a few brief words while she comes up here. Uh, Lydia started working at a factory in the Philippines at the age of 16, um, was recruited to be a missionary for an international church, and eventually trafficked into the U.S. by an international church and forced to become a domestic worker. In 2010, Lydia became a member of Damayan, and she has worked with them extensively in their training for community organizing and gender rights through their peer counseling training program and through the National Domestic Workers Alliance. Please welcome Lydia Katina Amaya. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. My name is Lydia Katina Amaya from Damayan Migrant Workers Association. Damayan is a proud founder and board member of the National Domestic Workers Alliance. We are excited to be here with all of you to discuss our movement. Many workers could not make it tonight, but I know they would be so happy to see all your support in the room. Thank you to Barnard and to all who organized this conference. I was a domestic worker for 12 years, and now I'm a staff worker organizer at the Mayan. I'm also an elected board member. Several, several years ago, I was trafficked into a dom domestic servitude in the U.S. Like so many of the sisters, I'm a survivor. I came to the U.S. in 1998 with religious organization. With this group, I experienced the abuse and exploitation that is still too common in the domestic work industry. My passport was taken. I was given a special mission to be a personal secretary for one of our, the church leaders, but it was not true. I ended up doing domestic work in New Jersey. I took care of the three young children. It was a 24 seven job. I sleep with the children in the same room. I had no salary no communication with my family. I was always hungry. I was told I have no right to complain because I am a missionary. I was able to escape my situation and became a member of Damayan in 2010. One of my first experience in Damayan was to join my sisters in Albany for the New York Domestic Workers Bill of Rights campaign. I was still undocumented at the time. We were at, on the balcony in the Capitol waiting for the result of the vote. I never experienced this in the Philippines. So I thought, even if we are undocumented, we have this opportunity to sit here and watch this process. From the balcony, you could see the legislators below and you could see who is the supporter of the bill and who isn't. And the bill was won. It was so emotional. We screamed, we hugged each other, crying. For so long, domestic workers had no protection. But at that moment, we felt that our work is valuable. It was so empowering. We saw that if our organization joined together, we will get justice. The domestic workers' fight did not end there. There are tens of thousands of domestic workers in New York. We need to organize more workers and take our movement further with new strategies, campaign, and coalitions. Jamayan partners with researchers, several of whom are in this room tonight. Those partnerships have helped us to develop our analysis, which in turn improves our work. 
Research help us understand the industry better and help us to build better strategies to winning our rights. Thank you again for being here. And on behalf of domestic workers and organizers, best wishes for the successful conference. Thank you again. Um, and it's now my pleasure to turn the program over to Linda Burnham. I can't just say here's Linda, even though she told me to do that, because I think I would not be fulfilling my responsibility as a host not to say how important Linda's work as a researcher, as an activist, as an organizer, as the founder of the Women of Color Resource Center and its executive director for 18 years, and in all of the writing that she's done and the import that it's had, most recently her response to Sheryl Sandberg's Lean In, the one per, called 1% Feminism, was uh, had a big impact. Um, and it's been an honor to work with her on this conference and to have her here as the leader of the conference. So, Linda Burnham. First of all, welcome all of you. Uh, it's so good to see you here this evening. I'm really happy to be in the room with you. Um, one of the things that I've been doing is uh, interviewing people about the New York State Bill of Rights campaign, among other things, and trying to find out what the lessons from that campaign were. Um, and one of the folks I talked to just a few weeks ago, I said, so wh what are the main takeaways? What are the main lessons from that campaign? And uh, she said, choose your partners well. And um, I just want to bring that to you because Barnard has been a dream partner. Uh, about a year and some ago, I came to uh, Premila Nadison, who you'll, you'll meet uh, tomorrow, and said, um, we need way more research capacity than we have, meaning uh, National Domestic Workers Alliance, with our one woman research team. That would be me. Um, lots of questions come my way and I can't answer them. And also we need to have a much stronger understanding of what's going on in the field. What are the scholars thinking about? What are they researching? And also how can we shape the field? And Premila said, let's go to Janet at the Barnard Center for Research on Women. And immediately, uh, without question, they said, yes, we want to do this, and have been extraordinary, generous partners ever since. So I really want to thank the Barnard Center for Research on Women. Janet Jacobson, in particular, the director, also, Anne Jonas, who's the program manager who couldn't be here this evening because she got a stomach bug, and she's been with us from the very beginning right up until today, a wonderful partner. Um, so let's give a round of applause, please, to the Barnard Center for Research on Women. So we had... Um, a dream partner, and then we have a dream panel. Uh, we started uh, talking, our little team started talking about, well, who do we want to have with us um, at this conference? And started making lists of the people whose work has been so influential in the field, leaders in the field, people who uh, have been working in the field now for decades and who've really expanded our understanding of domestic work, our analytical understanding, our um, understanding of what's going on for domestic workers historically and what's going on today, uh, contemporarily. And as we put those, that list together and we started calling people and people started saying yes, uh, and we were thrilled. And that's um, why we have this panel here today. I'm not going to take the time to introduce each of the panelists because you have this in your program. I want you to look at this program because we want to listen to them rather than hearing me read what you have here. <laughs> so I just want to say that as a group, this group of women has, um, there's the stars. Uh, in the field of research about uh, domestic work and domestic worker organizing. So I want to welcome them here this evening. <laughs> and
And we, uh, one of the things that we decided early on is that um, we wanted to have this not be, uh, we wanted to have this as a conversation, a conversation amongst the panelists and a conversation with you. So what we decided for this panel and other panels over the next couple of days will be organized a little bit differently. But for this panel, we decided we just pose questions and be in conversation with each other and then open it up to be in conversation with you. So I'm going to, um, first I wanna know, uh, we're looking back over the past couple of decades and I really um, am interested in understanding how the research has developed over that period. And first of all, what sparked your interest in research about domestic work and about domestic workers? What brought you to this field? So, any of you. Don't be shy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think as the oldest person on this panel, <laughs> Um, I have this feeling that we're, we're the sort of veterans, uh, grizzled veterans or something like that. Um, I, yeah, so I'll just speak about my own um, involvement. Um, I think that I was part of a cohort of um, women of color who came into the academy um, and we're just sort of making our, our marks uh, in the, starting in the 80s. And, um, so, and I think, so there was, I think, some sense of personal wanting to um, put women of color more in, in the center of history and sociology, um, and that a lot of the, our history was sort of unwritten or invisible or ignored. And um, I think a lot of us were aware that domestic work was one of the things that um, we shared. We may have had that. In, in our family, for example, um, my grandmother was a domestic worker in the San Francisco Bay Area, and I think it wasn't really well known that Japanese American women were very concentrated in, in domestic work, both in the Bay Area and also in Hawaii. So I think that was um, kind of my personal uh, connection to that. Um, and in a way, ironically, given the way in which the care crisis and other things have really made, um, you know, especially the care of the elderly really central, that I think at that time it appeared that domestic work as an occupation was dying out. Um, that the civil rights revolution had opened up opportunities for women of color and uh, you know, for generations, African American women uh, and also Latinos had had very few choices or no choice, and it was not an occupation of choice, but um, was one that um, you know women were in a sense compelled to do or to sometimes fall back on when other types of uh, employment were, were not available. And so I think there was the feeling that the, this sort of older generation of women who had been lifelong domestic workers was kind of the end of the line. And at least in my case, I felt like I wanted to get those experiences uh, recorded. So I did you know, interviews, and they were primarily older women that I interviewed. And of course, what we didn't foresee was that in fact it would be uh, a, a continuing and vital issue, and in fact has become more of an issue, especially with the uh, immigration of third world women who are doing the bulk of um, domestic work and care work, and it has become a, a sort of big issue. Thanks, Evelyn. I'd like to say yeah, that please. I'm the direct descendant of an enslaved woman who walked at three years old or was brought with an owner and her son and his 33 children they were domestic workers, and I grew up eavesdropping, listening to the oldest ones talking about being live-in servants and the youngest ones talking about daily paid household workers, like my mother, who eventually would become a beautician. But I'd like to say that I knew in graduate school much of what I was reading was wrong, that they were not voiceless victims, ignorant, ignoble women, women 
but they created a bridge of bent backs over which I came. I am very clear on that, and the first part of my book opens up with me going to a tea party with my great aunt and women of her age, and she had to apologize for my ignorance because I had never done service work. They had luncheons for each other. They had fabulous lives, better bank accounts than I have today, mm -hmm. and they created a world that, in a sense, wasn't framed by their work or the people for whom they worked. And I will be very specific. I had a great aunt who could quote Dickens. I thought she was college educated. I didn't realize until I started, she was one of my 90 plus interviews, that she learned to dust a table very slowly. During the summers, she went with Senator Clark to New England. So he had children who were, as she called them, dull. And she learned how to stand there and dust a table for hours so that she could learn what these tutors were teaching them. Very important for me is the fact that my goal was to make sure that the story and the reality of their lives as workers came to the fore. I don't know how to talk about their broader analyses and the political and economic and social uh, interface. I can talk about the fact that these were women with dynamic lives and important social networks that enhanced the community with that I lived in, grew up in, and became a part of. I have to say that as women workers, the meaning of freedom was never lost on me. It was never lost on the kind of education I was allowed and permitted by their sacrifice to get, and most importantly, how I have, have a responsibility of passing it on. So I think that when we talk about the complexity of the field, many of us come to it, or I can say I came to it, in a very personal way via several generations of enslaved people, people who assumed um, my wonderful friend Nell Painter found a series of letters from a Reverend T.O. Madden, and one of them, he was one of the few African Americans who could write, but this enslaved person had listed out the work his children would do, and all the young women had a specific amount of training, every one of the 33. So I think that what we have to understand is that household work was work for some for many people, but it's not the work that defined them. They had rich lives and they were a part of a social network and a cultural quilt that they developed. They were able to weave it and they are the ones whose voices we have to hear and understand when we try to understand women and work and the complexities of both. Thank you. I came to this research, um, actually I grew up with it all my life, but never thought of it as research until 1980 when I went to El Paso, Texas to start my first job. And I stayed with a colleague who had a uh, young teenager um, immigrant from Mexico living in his house that was a uh, live-in domestic worker. And I was really shocked at their treatment of her, the way that her, his kids treated her, the way he treated her, and I spoke to her about her situation, and she explained to me that she wasn't coming back because she was so lonely. And she wasn't lonely because there weren't other uh, Mexican workers or because she was missing Mexican culture, as her employer assumed, but it was because no one talked to her in the home. And I was so shocked from that experience. I still recall getting on the plane to go home. And for the first time, thinking about my mother, who's been a domestic worker, and thinking about, my God, did somebody treat her like this? How did she deal with the racist comments that were made to her, kind of sexism? And then I started to think about when I was growing up as an adolescent myself, going to work with her and later as a graduate student, how it felt to be an ABD cleaning somebody else's toilet who only had a bachelor's degree. It didn't quite seem fair. And uh, so when I did start doing my research, um, I turned to uh, other sociologists that were working in the field, and I was very um, influenced by the work of Evelyn and um, of Judith Rollins, and I want to give a big shout out to her. She's sitting over there. I wish I could stand up, please. And re 
reading their work, and I started to realize that the two really exciting things about this particular research that could be offered. One was the feminist research was completely void of any inclusion of women talking about housework as a paid issue. They talked about housework as being an issue that incorporated all women because all women were burdened with housework, but they never took into consideration that they were released of their burden by turning it over to a woman of color. The other thing that drew me into this research was it was a perfect place to look at intersectionality of race, class, and gender because it brought it into the intimacy of the home and the interaction. And that was my draw. Thank you, Heather. Well, I have a slightly different story because I came to this because of my own realization of social class. Uh, for I grew up uh, in a home where labor took place. And for the last 40 years, I've looked at the home as a workplace for all kinds of labor. My mother thought of herself as a suburban housewife. But actually, what she was doing was rolling money to deposit in the bank, because my father was a ice cream man. He was the Jewish peddler for the uh, modern age. And we lived in a place where everybody else had servants come in. Uh, and my father drove a truck and ran his business out of our basement. And my mother's great aunt decided every once in a while to loan her Miss Betty. And I just couldn't understand this. She was going to give my mother a gift to undo her burden. And it was those kinds of contradictions of growing up working class where everybody else had more. And the contradictions of race in growing up in a period in which the civil rights movement was all around me, that I became interested in the contradictions of the differences between women and the ways that some women benefit from other women and the fissures in the ideology of sisterhood. And so I came, so I began to uh, learn and to listen to the freedom movements of the 60s and the early 1970s. An incredible experience for me was the privilege of teaching at Howard University. She was my office mate for 14 years in which I learned more from my students than perhaps I taught them. And I learned how to listen. And, and I became then attracted to uh, the Marxist feminist debate over uh, housework, over the relationship between productive and reproductive labor, the wages for housework debate, uh, the insights of Angela Davis on the, on the necessary work that was done. And, and this is what began to shape my activism. And, it was a moment when, as a historian, social history came to the fore. And we were learning to uncover the voices that were not previously listened to. And finally, I viewed and I saw that domestic labor and domestic work and domestic workers had a history, that it wasn't natural, these relationships because it was changing under our eyes in the 1970s with the changes of the movement of some women into African-American women, into other jobs, some, the movement of new generation of immigrants from the Americas, from Asia, and elsewhere, and the work itself going, what seemed to be going out of the home into uh, for-profit companies, somehow going back into the home with uh, professional women feeling that they could pay for another woman to do their work. So just as breasts was best, we were told, so uh, bringing somebody into your home was supposed to be best rather than sending your laundry out or sending your child out to a daycare. Thank you.
So my interest actually grew out of a frustration when I was in college because there weren't any books on black women, period. And there weren't any books on ordinary black women, especially. Um, so women's history was sort of just becoming um, kind of popular and people were starting to do research. There were, there were definitely books on, on women's history, but they were mainly focused on middle class women, on white women. And so when I decided to go to graduate school, my goal was to try to figure out how to study the lives of ordinary women. And so because domestic work was the primary occupation for African Americans, especially after slavery ends, and that was the period that I was interested in, um, black women either worked in the farms or they worked in domestic work, I decided that I wanted to pursue um, a study on domestic workers. I was also very interested in Southern history and looking at the urban South. And the way that the history of the urban South had been written had been primarily from the perspective of men, even though most southern cities were actually dominated by women. Women were disproportionately represented in urban areas because they were essentially pushed out of the rural areas um, if they were single especially. Um, so those, the combination of working on domestic workers and also looking at the urban south is what inspired my, my book on domestic workers. There were several things that I was interested in in pursuing and looking at these women, I wanted to first of all acknowledge their agency as historical actors, as workers, but also just as human beings. I wanted to capture them as three-dimensional figures, as, as workers, as wives, as sisters, as um, women engaged in a variety of activities in their neighborhoods, in their communities. Um, I was very interested in looking at the importance of domestic work itself, because the way it had been written about tended to de-emphasize its role in the economy. It was seen as you know, work that was done by women in the context of private homes. Therefore, it wasn't really considered labor history. It wasn't considered, um, these, w these were not women who were considered making important contributions to the polit political economy. And so I was really interested in, in thinking about domestic work in relationship to the political economy of the South, especially in the transition from slavery to freedom and in the nation um, as a whole. I was also very interested in the character of the relationships between workers and employers and the contentious character of those relationships. So I started my book project, which was at first a dissertation, by doing a paper on the washerwomen strike in Atlanta, Georgia in 1881. And so I, that paper became a, a kind of model for me to figure out how to write a broader history of domestic workers. I wasn't sure that I would find many more strikes. There, I knew about, you know, there were other strikes in Galveston, Texas, in Jackson, Mississippi, in the post-war period, post-Civil War period. But as I started to, to do the research, I actually found while there weren't a lot of organized strikes, there was a lot of resistance. There were lots of organized, daily, unorganized, mostly unorganized resistance that took place within the context of the household. So those were the things, those were the main things that really inspired my interest in domestic workers. Thank you so much. Um, so I'd like to hear, what, what work did you all build on? What, what was there before you that you found um, useful uh, in terms of uh, frameworks and in terms of just kind of information? What, what were you building on? You were this, um, folks who started doing this work in the 70s and 80s were not the first folks to uh, think about and do research on domestic uh, work and domestic workers. So what were you building on? Um, and then also, um, what do you all feel like you brought that was new? What new frameworks evolved? What new discoveries? I was going to say, um, I don't know why I'm, I'm going first again, but go more or less in order. But um, I was definitely influenced by um, sort of a Marxist feminist perspective and the notion of reproductive labor, which is a way of um, connecting what, uh, you know, domestic labor, both paid and unpaid, as in fact 
central to the political economy. That is, just as uh, capitalism produces goods and, and services, um, the, uh, the economy cannot operate without the reproduction of human beings, you know, just on a, both on a daily basis, feeding and clothing and uh, providing for the workers' needs mm -hmm. and also raising the next generation. So that was the kind of thing that I was um, influenced by. Um, and I think that concept was, um, was critical. The other thing that I got into was um, working, um, kind of looking at connections and comparisons uh, in the experiences of uh, black and um, uh, Latina and Asian American women. So I was part of a group um, that was uh, centered at Memphis State University, led by Bonnie Dill. Mm -hmm. And we started doing this kind of comparative group uh, where we actually started with things like novels, uh, reading about the experiences of different groups of women. Uh, because before that, I think there was this kind of compartmentalization where we felt um, only authorized to speak about our own group. Um, and I, I felt that somehow reading, our reading across the groups led us to find connections in women's, you know, women of color's lives across these different groups. So that was kind of where the direction that my work went. And um, looking at the commonalities in terms of uh, of the concentration of these different group of, of women of color in domestic service and their relationships with white women kind of led me to this concept of what I call the racial division of reproductive labor. And uh, so the, the notion, uh, I think, that has, has been already raised about the fact that um, some groups of women can actually, in a sense, foist off the, 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 the less, um, the dirtier, the harder parts of the labor onto other groups of women. And so that even though all, sort of women in general are responsible for this kind of household work, in fact, um, women don't have the same relationship to it, you know, depending on class and race. And I think that that was um, kind of the, the, the direction that my work took in terms of, um, you know, as I said, I think the influence of that, of, of kind of women of color um, be, you know, kind of reading across the different groups and uh, sort of sharing our, own, our stories across the groups was very important to me. I'd like to say that I wish mine was an academic um, background that sort of spurred me on, but as I said, it was very personal in terms of my own family growing up and hearing people all of my life talking about the work that they did, either as a live-in servant or a daily paid household worker. I also have to say it was very personal since it was pushed on me. I started graduate school and having taught three years at a college before I started my PhD, I started in the room and the person said, you can't come in second time, don't come in third time, you can't come in. I, you know, I looked behind me, mm -hmm. who are you talking to? And the person said they've already gotten the trash. So, and I had um, uh, worked hard to make sure that my first graduate class was with a person who had written on African American history, who had won awards as an African American scholar. And so this person made it clear that if you're African American and female in this building, you must be coming to get the trash. And this was in 1980. So while people have a real nice comfort level of how this sort of reaches around them, it comes for African American women frequently very personally and like a train, it hits you. And it never lets you forget that basically you're there to clean. Um, I, I don't think that that limits one because I come from people who make it clear that no matter what you put in front of them, they're going to, if they can't get over it, they're going to go around it, they go under it, they'll figure a way to get by it. But what you have to do is, for me at least, it became important that the more I read, and I don't want to call names like Katzman and others, they didn't understand domestic work, and they surely didn't understand the people that I knew from my family, my community, my church. That was fine. I think what happened for me is people like as you said, Bonnie Thornton Dill, Judith Rollins, 
Phyllis Palmer, a white woman from George Washington University who worked, talked about domesticity and dirt. And it begins to push you to think a different way. But in the end, it was the women I interviewed, all 90 plus of them who'd worked with my great aunt and others, who gave me a segue into their world, their social networks, and very important for me, what I think I brought out, the fact that they had their own banking system, kindergarten system. They had their own series of making sure that they could empower themselves. It wasn't external. It was internal. It was a community of women that they developed. Um, what do I think it means in the end, it means that um, people like my good friend, Marsha Gundy, who has supported my work and from translating to just doing everything, it means that you get a great sense of your own history, but it means that you also pass it on. We have a wonderful young graduate student, April Silver, who's an activist at Howard, who's coming into our program. It means that people like Kimberly Brown and Sherelle Williams, who's doing women and images right now in terms of television, it means that, and working women, I'm sorry, she's talking about working women, and particularly women doing domestic work, it means that you create an environment in which, as I said, you reframe how people are looked at. And it's very nice if you can do it from afar, but frequently, at least for me, it was very personal. And it's not a negative, it's a reality as an African American female that it worked, it was a work for me, and that I felt compelled almost to do. I think that women invested. Once I started the oral interviews, people would tell someone else, and they would tell someone else, and they told someone else. Because it started off with my own great aunt, there was never a wall. And so they opened up about work and life and everything from sexual exploitation to just the kind of conditions women work in. And I don't say past tense, because it's many of them are still working in those same kinds of conditions. So I think that it's important in a conference like, uh, like this for people to understand that it is not necessarily a historical reality. And that's why it's so important, the organization and activism of women. And I think the most important thing that someone gave me, it was a handbill that a person had had when they were trying to organize workers in the early 1930s. Um, they would pass them out at the bus stop. So people, who don't understand, there are not enough records frequently. They didn't stop, they didn't keep diaries like George Washington, mm -hmm. they didn't do all the things that historians like. But the information is there, the material is there, and the history is there. It's up to us to figure ways and innovative ways of getting it. I'd like to actually talk about Phyllis Palmer, who, uh, who was in conversations with her for many, many years really shaped my understanding and my work. And Phyllis passed in uh, April. And so in some sense, I feel like I'm here instead of her. Um, Domesticity and Dirt really, I thought, brought out three key contributions of this new literature, which I'd like to share with you. Um, first, that distinction between the housewife and the servant. What Dorothy Roberts, uh, another fine African-American scholar, would capture through that dichotomy of spiritual versus menial housework, with the first associated with the mistress and the second with the maid. And these categories were learned and constructed through advice books and popular culture and socialization and the fundamental organizing of society. This, um, her second, I think, big influence was the devaluing of what I've later with Russell Perennis called intimate labor that involves touch and dirt and bodily closeness, the particular personal knowledge that um, the domestic worker knew of the people whose house she was in, but the people knew nothing about her life because, in one hand, they just weren't interested, and in the other, that was her life. But this uh, association of dirt with racialized others, a legacy of slavery and the construction of whiteness as purity, is something that Phyllis really innovated in talking about, drawing upon psychoanalysis, uh, attack not much uh, followed, but one that she kind of drew out, I think, from the great Southern anti-racist white writer, Lillian Smith. Uh, and then uh, also this insight uh, that it, what is being bought and sold, as one other scholar put it, um, is the person herself. 
misunderstanding about the way in which the white mistress looked at um, the person who was cleaning up after her. And the third is really the area where I've taken off on, uh, and that's the significance of the state. That is a public policy, uh, beginning with the New Deal, in perpetuating the racial division of labor and excluding household workers from labor standards, from collective bargaining, and from social security. And others of us here in this room have written about that. But that is so important to understand not only the, is the orders that we've lived in not natural, but, and it isn't just that they're constructed by something called the economy, but there are people in, with political power, and it is a political struggle. And that's something that I think um, Phyllis uh, taught us, and more recent uh, authors, I'm thinking of Margaret Jacobs working about the um, Bureau of Indian Affairs, teaching us about, again, the construction of domestic workers by state apparatus. And just to mention two, um, very quickly, um, four mothers, uh, Esther Cooper Jackson, um, her 1940 MA thesis from Fisk, the Negro woman domestic worker in relation to trade unionism, if we have time later, I'll talk about that. And, uh, or maybe someone else will, and I'm so excited that she's going to be honored later. And another neglected study which relates to the state is a German immigrant, um, Irma uh, Magnus, who later taught at Howard uh, in the School of Social Work. And she was a pioneer researcher in the 1930s for the International Labor Organization about decent standards for workers. And then she worked for the US Bureau of Social Security in looking at black women workers in private homes in the US. And she came up with this notion that we should abandon the distinction, she put it, between covered and non-covered employment, that we should recognize that people have um, an unbroken cycle of work, and sometimes the work is covered by labor standards and by social security, and sometimes it isn't, and that we need a new way of calculating what um, the pensions and the benefits and the future of people who make our work possible. I'd like to mention some of the earlier scholarship that I think we were all working against, um, not necessarily <laughs> building upon, but scholarship that actually had a really, you know, important influence on the work that we, I think we've all done. Um, Lucy Maynard Salmon was probably the first scholar to do a study of domestic workers in 1897. She was actually a history professor at Vassar College and was um, a pioneer, you know, as a woman teaching college at the time, yeah. and doing it in very non-traditional ways, using primary sources, getting the students to not just memorize facts and, and things like that. Um, but her book was based on questionnaires that she passed out, mainly to employers and to mm -hmm. some workers, but the, the workers got their questionnaires through their employers. So you can imagine <laughs> that that could be a little bit complicating. Yeah. Um, the problem with her book was that she argued that wages were not really a problem, that the problem with domestic workers, and the, the, around that time, lots of people were talking about the servant crisis. And the crisis was there weren't enough domestic workers to fill the positions of middle class and elite homes. And so her book basically tried to suggest that it wasn't a problem of wages, that wages were competitive, um, that they were high relative to other workers. The problem was more social, having to, to do with the stigma attached to domestic work. Mm -hmm. And so what it, the unfortunate thing that that book did was that it, it basically um, encouraged reformers to address the social, the so-called social problems and not deal with the problems of wages and think about the economics of domestic work. Um, she was also, Salmon was also a reformer, so you could see how those roles kind of um, sort of played into the, the kind of work that she was doing. Um, but because it was a pioneering study, others, be, you know, for decades later really relied a lot on her, on her scholarship, despite some of the problems with the methods and especially with the kind of sampling that she was using with the questionnaires. Um, but nonetheless, one of her 
students, Isabel Eaton wrote a book, wrote a, not really a book, but wrote a study on domestic workers in Philadelphia, on African-American women domestic workers in Philadelphia in 1899. So that's the first time we have a study devoted to African-American women um, who were domestics. And it was part of W.E.B. Du Bois's The Philadelphia Negro. Um, and Eaton was, she actually received a master's here at Columbia, um, which Du Bois supervised. And so that was the first. And then we, in the 1910s, the New York Independent, which was a kind of weekly magazine, published a lot of first-person narratives um, by domestic workers and other workers. Um, that was around 19, 1904 to 1912 or so, 1914. The first African-American woman to write about domestic workers was Elizabeth Ross Haynes. In 1924, she wrote um, a study that was published in the Journal of Negro History called Negroes in Domestic Service. And she actually received her MA at Columbia. So there's a lot of Columbia um, University students involved in this, this early pioneering scholarship. Um, she was from the South. She went to Fisk University, graduated in 1903. She was very also involved in social reform. All these women are social scientists slash social reformers and she worked for the U.S. Department of Labor. And Carter G. Woodson, who's um, one of our, our pioneering historians as well, wrote an article called The Negro Washerwoman in 1930. Right. And then there's a gap. I don't know if you guys remember very much in between 1930 and 1970, but it's not until 1978 that David Katzman writes his book, right. which is the probably the next generation of, you know, sort of a broad history of domestic workers, right, which we all have problems with, right. but nonetheless. Right. That's why I mentioned um, the people from the 40s. I'm the sorry? Early, that's why I mentioned those two uh -huh. scholars from the early 40s. Yeah. But I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah. I'd also like to add quickly that one of the first four graduates of Howard, was, people don't realize, were women, the first four, and one of them did a pamphlet, a very small pamphlet on women in work and although it wasn't published or isn't widely known, a number of young women were doing this kind of work. Um, I was trying to think of um, Mary Church Terrell and a number of others. Unfortunately, because they don't have the same kind of publications that others had, but there are a number of pamphlets that they put out which are doing the same, it's kind of the same, they're attempting to get people to understand, as you said, these primary concerns and uh, Alain Locke, Woodson, and a number of others. Um, uh, I'm thinking also of Dorothy Porter, Wesley, mm -hmm. and a number of others, um, many of them at uh, historically black universities who were doing the work. Unfortunately, their publications sort of get shuttled off as, in a sense as like pamphlets or essays, but they're very mm -hmm. insightful in terms of, as you're saying, understanding the work. And the last point I'd like to make, there was a, there's a scholar by the name of Dr. Paul Phillips Cook, and his grandmother kept the most unbelievable diary, which he let me read, and I'm trying to get the family to get it published. But so much of it is intimate. It's what people kept, and people don't necessarily want this information uh, in the broader public. So I, just, I think there's a complexity there in terms of where the research is and, and a number of the studies that are those early studies and what, comp what, what comprises these kinds of studies. That's why I think what we're doing is so important that we're looking at those that, as you said, others haven't even understood or if they incur if they do use them, and I hate to go back to poor Katzman, but they incorporate them in ways that are just mm -hmm. for women, we see it differently. Mm -hmm. Well, it does, I mean, I was going to say that this is very relevant to uh, this conference because even though there may be good work going on and good research, uh, whether, in, uh, you know, I think you're absolutely right that a lot of those early things were, were incredible and yet they, you know, had almost no impact and were forgotten during that kind of long mm -hmm. period, you know, from in the 40s to the 70s and so it's like, in a way, who are we speaking to and who can, you know, who, is, who, who can hear us? Um, yeah, the uh, so why, if I, if I might ask, um, if 
trying to kind of get a, uh, an assessment and an overview of the work, maybe starting in the late 70s into the 80s and 90s. Um, and maybe we'll start with Mary on um, this um, end since she didn't get in on this last round. Um, just a sense of uh, kind of the main accomplishments of that body of research, um, new frameworks, new issues addressed, but also any um, limitations of the, of the work of that, you know, starting in that earlier period, this phase of um, scholarship about domestic work. I think that it, within sociology, I, what the tools that were used in research were primarily ethnography and participant right. observation and interviews. And um, I, I think what we really gained was getting a very thick description of what was going on within the work. And I know Judith Rollins, again, her work, uh, she introduced me to the book Maids and Madams and by Jacqueline Koch. On, on the situation in South Africa and looking at that situation and seeing the ways in which the mistress could uh, structure the work in such a way to make it demeaning and to um, emphasize the inequality between um, the employer and the employee. And that really had an impact on me because I started to exactly think about what the women that I interviewed told me about the way that they went about doing their work, um, how they structured it, um, how they, much they preferred to work in a home where the employer wasn't there so they wouldn't have a boss and they could decide exactly how fast they were going to work or how slow they were going to work or when they were going to take a break and how to go about cleaning the house. It was, it was very strategic and of course I had never really thought about that, and, and most people that think about housework think about it, they don't really have a sense of it because they're doing it, they stop and have a telephone call, they answer the door, they sit down and watch a television show, whatever, but to actually do it as work, and um, they had a process, it was very, very efficient, and they knew a great deal about cleaning products and so forth, and so looking at it in terms of the labor process was very important. The other thing that, that I think contributed was looking at as part of the, for most women, it was part of the underground economy, which meant how did these employers and employees come together? Where were they finding each other? How did they go about establishing? And once they did make that connection, how did they go about establishing that um, informal contract or that work group relationship? And how, what kind of strategies did the employer use to try and get more work out of the, the worker? And what strategies did the worker try to use in order to maintain the integrity of, of her work contract? So, because if she did more work, that meant her work was lessened in value economically. And so it was, it was very interesting to see how extremely um, conscious these decisions were being made in terms of the employer to safeguard, make sure she, she got the money that she deserved, Secondly, that she wasn't taken advantage and that she was able to get home and take care of her own family and didn't have to stay around taking care of other people's children or waiting for a delivery or whatever. Um, so I think that that real important um, thick description about sort of the detailed work that goes into that um, was a contribution, very important contribution that, that um, this generation, my generation of scholars made to in sociology. Thanks. Others on that same question? Sure. Uh, I think what begins to happen in the late 80s and then into the 90s and into more recent time is really trying to counter the notion that domestic worker work could not be organized and domestic workers couldn't be organized. That there be, for a long time, there was Tara's work that showed that domestic workers did organize. Uh, there was work in many places that showed the weapons of the weak kind of argument, the kind of subversion argument of breaking dishes, giving you know, food to your visitors, having visitors when you're not supposed to have visitors uh, in the kitchen, uh, bring, borrowing clothing, et cetera. Uh, but in focusing on the New Deal era, uh, the question became, well, where were the domestic workers? And it took us a long time to, to really learn a lot about Dora Jones and the domestic 
worker union, uh, which split off from an organization of hotel workers and others and was connected to what becomes SEIU, the Service Employees International Union. So this very early domestic worker uh, local, I think it was called 149 in, in uh, New York, uh, was rooted in the service economy from the very beginning. And these kinds of connections between the home and other workplaces as places where women circulated between sometimes working in a private home, sometimes working in a hospital, sometimes being on public assistance if they were a citizen, and sometimes uh, working in a hotel uh, as a chambermaid or so. So we began to uh, reconstruct that. And when, I, when Jen Klein and I began working on home health care workers and giving these elder uh, care workers a history, I was intrigued. I remembered that Phyllis had written in her book about visiting housekeepers very, very briefly. And nobody knew what they really were. And we discovered that was really the origin of a home health care worker. And it was a kind of a category under the New Deal uh, to bring uh, people who needed help outside of hospitals, it'd be kind of a reverse foster care too, to bring people home and take a woman, often who was a former domestic worker who was out of work, uh, and bring her back, in, bring her into the home under the WPA with better pay and being called in, in a dignified way, et cetera, and having standards. So this is some of what... Um, we began to uncover an organizing past. Just a maybe one more comment, and then we're going to open it up okay, to the. Okay. Floor. I was just going to um, sort of uh, maybe build on what Mary was saying. That I think as part of doing this sort of ethnographic work, especially in the case of Judith Rollins, who um, sort of worked as a domestic, um, is is the notion of unrecognized skills that um, that. Uh, it's often seen as um, very unskilled and you know not requiring specialized abilities or doesn't have any cognitive you know um, mental and emotional um, uh, parts of it and I think what the work revealed is is the way in which it is very much skilled work and involves managing the employer you know in terms of having to sort of read the employer's mood and kind of knowing what kind of works with the, with the employer. And in the case of especially caregiving, that that requires an enormous knowledge. And you know what struck me when there was sort of the debate about whether you know, care, carers of the elderly in the home should be covered by the Fair Labor Standards Act, uh, I think that was done in the 70s. There was a kind of discussion in the 70s, and to hear the senators, male senators, talking about this work, essentially they see it as kind of babysitting with the elderly, that you're kind of sitting there watching television and keeping the person company. And that's why it's called the companionship exemption, that you know, home care for the elderly is seen as being a companion for the, the elderly. And so it totally trivializes and does not recognize the work. And so I think the counter to that is, is very important as part of the sort of worker organizing, I think, of just sort of making that assertion uh, about, about what, is, what is actually required emotionally, mentally, et cetera, for the worker. I'm going to open it up to broaden out the conversation. Um, I realized that I didn't do one thing, which was to introduce my mom, who's a daughter, <laughs> <laughs> daughter of immigrant domestic workers. And it's here this evening. So. <laughs> Um, but I wanted to, um, to start our broader conversation, uh, if I could ask uh, Judith Rollins if she has any <laughs> comments to make. We struggled mightily uh, to get Judith Rollins on the panel because <laughs> of her foundational work uh, about domestic workers. Um, she wasn't able at that time to agree, but she is here this evening, <laughs> so, uh, which I'm thrilled about. So if 
you wanted to start us out in the kind of broader conversation, we'd love to hear from you. And there's there's a mic right behind you. <laughs> not to just just please. happens to be a mic. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure this is the appropriate place, but one of the things I'd like to see uh, brought up at the conference generally with um, alternatives, I, I, alternatives to addressing the issues of domestic servants. That is, I think the um, NDWA is doing marvelous work and it actually, um, I'm proud to be in one of the four states now, I believe, that has uh, passed legislation uh, for, to protect domestics. Uh, but also, I'd like to see us go back to, for example, Angela Davis's work when she proposed an industrialization of domestic service uh, because that addresses not only the job itself, but also the need of domestics in their own homes for support. Um, I'd also like to, at, at the risk of having Mary call me a utopian, <laughs> I'd also like us to take a look at um, the Cuban program uh, for the government supporting education of domestics, training of domestics, so that they can move out of the occupation. Um, as all of us know, most of the women doing the work would really prefer to do something else. Uh, and I'd like us to look at ways that we might enable them to do that something else that was their dream, to be a nurse, to be a teacher. I heard all kinds of stories like that, that was unfulfilled because uh, the opportunity wasn't there. Uh, so I'd like to look at those broader questions. The Cuba, by the way, I mentioned the Cuban um, program, which lasted four or five years, in which Cuba, the domestics were, first of all, educated, because many of them were illiterate, and then trained for jobs, bank tellers, clerks, secretaries, all kinds. And by the end of the program, in fact, there was a period in Cuba when there were no domestic workers. And that seems like almost incomprehensible, but it isn't incomprehensible. And I'd like us to look at some of those other kinds of things also somewhere during this conference. Thank you so much. So other folks, we're going to just open it up if you have uh, questions, comments. My name is Ruth Ice. My interest is in the decriminalization of the undocumented. Um, I'm passionately interested in that. I think a good model exists for that. Uh, the Vera Institute of Justice um, started many programs. Um, based on the model of pretrial diversion. In other words, diverting people away from criminal justice system and offering upfront services, um, which is an important um, aspect of um, addressing the needs of immigrants in any case. Um, the Beer Institute is involved in um, advocacy, so they had a conflict of interest. But I sure the hell want to know who's interested in um, a pilot project to decriminalize um, the undocumented. Hi, um, my name is Christine Lewis and I'm here with Domestic Workers United New York. Um, contingent and the cultural points person for the movement. So we talk about, the conversation is about um, labor, I mean the American women who have established and written um, theories and finding on domestic work. But most times I find that Caribbean women have been excluded from these conversations and you know where, where since after, this, after the 20s or the 60s we are here in droves doing, not leaving to do domestic work, but because of policies and whatever, we're here to, we're doing the domestic work. Yet sometimes the, the, the immigrant women of color, the Caribbean women, or even the Latino women, are most times excluded from these conversations. Yeah, we hear about all the women who have been, who've been pioneering and leading and writing papers, but yet the Caribbean women has been excluded from this conversation. And I'm, I'm, it, it drives me as somebody who's really, 
who's read a lot on domestic work and, 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 and the domestic workers, laundry workers. As well as to the other side of this conversation is when we sit with the immigrant women of color, we still hear this thing about, um, well, we're organizing domestic workers, women of color, right? But yet you hear uh, the Latino sisters will say, well, we're not colored. We hear that word. <laughs> yeah, we, we have those conversations. We're sitting around the, 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 I wouldn't say the wrong table, the wrong chairs. And the Latino sisters said to me, um, they actually look at their skin and say, well, we're not, we're not color. We hear that terminology, women of color. But then, therefore, who are we? Yeah. So these are the other parts of these conversations that we need to speak about, even within organizing women of color. We, we, we see that elephant pop up from time to time. So I say to hell with it. Let's organize Caribbean women. <laughs> <laughs> right? If we're getting that flat. And then you don't want to be so nationalistic or, you know, it, it creates a wedge. Hello? Thank you. I'd invite you to look at the writings of Dr. Lydia Lindsay. She's a scholar at North Carolina Central University, which is a historically African-American university in North Carolina. She must have last count, 10 or 12 pamphlets that deal with African-American, African women from the Caribbean who are in the North American continent and their issues of work. Again, much that's done, let's say, at what we call HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities, although we forget people like um, John Hope Franklin and others started, Du Bois was at Fisk, we tend to forget that many of these scholars are doing great work. So I'd invite you to look at Lydia Lindsay's in terms of her question of uh, decriminalization, I'd ask you to also understand that this issue of decriminalization is very serious for people of African descent, because many Africans who left areas of the South um, left under conditions in which they were facing all kinds of charges. So the whole issue of decriminalization um, from the end of the Civil War forward up through um, sharecropping, you have lots of people who were, um, they would do sweeps for laborers. So this whole issue of decriminalization and many of these men and women went to their graves with these kinds of charges against them. So this whole issue of decriminalization um, transcends just issues of uh, the recent history. It is a serious issue in the history of the United States. I also wanted to mention, um, Christine, that tomorrow, um, there's a panel that's devoted to uh, the issues having to do with uh, immigrant mm -hmm. uh, domestic workers and the globalization of the labor force. Right. So um, in all likelihood, some of the uh, questions that you raise and put on the table will be addressed in that panel tomorrow just before lunch. Yeah. There's actually there's some research that shows, uh, Sarah Hangley's research shows the uh, the um, Georgia criminal penal code yes. was what she calls casero uh, service, uh, the connection between prisons and, and sending out uh, women who were incarcerated to be domestic workers. So there's some very interesting connections in that, in that history between criminalization. And Sarah Haley, right over there, yeah. is actually doing work on that very issue. Um, I'm Chitra. I've been a longtime volunteer with Andala and organizing South Asian workers, which is based in Queens, New York. And we're in the process. We were an incorporated nonprofit, and at some point in the late, like, 2009-10, lost funding, like a lot of other sort of nonprofits organizing. And we're interested at this point of documenting our work as organizers and documenting the disputes the, both the successes but also the challenges of organizing domestic workers, of what happens when some workers are able to change their immigration status and others don't, what happens when some people win cases and others don't. So I feel like we have a lot of rich history that we want to make sure doesn't just disappear along with tax-exempt status. So I've come hunting, um, hunting for a researcher. Um, <laughs> like a little bit of a, yeah, looking for, uh, uh, and also somebody who will help to train us in, in doing oral histories of one another so that our members have a chance to share their stories because like a lot of small organizing groups, we had volunteer staff and then one paid staff and maybe one and a half and a lot of 
the stuff that went down and got discussed is not is not in minutes or in files. It's all in people's heads and the people who people feel safest will start to share it with each other. So we'd love to document it for the continuing organizing that's going on today. So one of the suggestions that I would make is to start um, creating archives mm -hmm. and don't lose that information, all your correspondence, um, any kind of newsletters, all of that material, save it. If you can um, start to interview each other and create your own archival material, and I'm sure that one of the women's resource centers will you know, uh, make it available to researchers, and then they can go directly to you and continue doing uh, more. But in the meantime, until somebody does step in, um, we're losing that, um, that very important history. And I think sharing those, particularly those lessons that you learn through, strat, uh, through organizing is so important so that the next group can add to that and it can keep growing and growing. I'd suggest that you also go to the Humanities Council. People forget that it's your tax dollars and a portion of the national endowment, state endowment, local endowment, you can go to them for small grants and get a grant to uh, create this archive. And they usually have people as a part of the council who will help you with the initial grant writing. It doesn't have to be one of these that was that thick. They have what they call quick response grants. So begin to look at the Humanities Council and the resources you have in your community, then in the city, state, and then of course the federal, but there are grants that you can go after that will help you uh, maintain this information that you want. And I would invite you to try your best to keep control of it yourself. Mm -hmm. I, I would suggest uh, sort of videoing, uh, making videos of, of interviews, because I think that's a, that, that would be, I think make it maybe more available to people. Um, than sort of transcripts and that kind of thing. Or even people, um, I think people can be trained to make videos also, their own videos of what they want to say, uh, what kind of statements they want to make to people. Um, and you know, if they were speaking to, to the public or to legislatures. So I think there are a lot of creative ways that this can be done. Yeah. And I also believe and subversing, uh, using the resources of universities uh, there's a lot of researchers in this room who can get money from their universities, but we have to be willing to give up control. So I want to, before I go to the next question, I want to just take this opportunity to do an advertisement for you all. So um, hopefully everybody has this program book. In the program, there's a lot of people here who are hunting for researchers. <laughs> um, I want to direct your attention in the program book. We put together a wiki space, a uh, place on the internet for this conference. Um, is Emily here? Our good friends at Cornell, let's just say our fabulous friends at um, the Cornell Workers Institute, uh, found us a young woman who I haven't yet met face to face, we've been talking from California, who put together a wiki space on which there are now a whole round of proposals that organizers are submitting to researchers. So I wanna, I'm putting this out to you because I want you to go to that wiki space, it's justiceinthehome.wikispaces.com, you'll find it in here. You can, um, if you're a researcher or you have graduate students, and I know you do, who are looking for a project, mm -hmm. then they can find a project here. There are already about 10, somewhere between 10 and 15 proposals posted on the site already. Mm. Uh, and we want this to be an active site. So if there are people who are doing organizing around domestic work and domestic workers, you can post a proposal to the site we're actively trying to make matches, right? Mm -hmm. So use that as a resource. The other resource I'll say, I happen to know there's an archivist in the room. Raise your hand. <laughs> <laughs> so this lady here is putting together a fabulous collection. Uh, it's the first time I've met her face to face, um, but I've been in communication with her for many years now, actually. <laughs> um, it's putting together 
information about women's organizing and has a strong and special interest in the organizing of women of color. And I say this to people all the time, don't lose your papers, don't let them be thrown away because someone will come along who wants to read about what you did. Either someone who's trying to learn from it so that they too can do organizing or a historian who's trying to tell the story. So if you have papers, uh, talk to Joyce about ways that you might think about starting to preserve that work. Mi nombre es Araceli Herrera y soy de Domésticas Unidas de San Antonio, Texas. Uh, yo, eh, yo quisiera preguntarle si alguna vez han hecho una investigación del de fenómeno que pasa con las trabajadoras domésticas, que muchas de ellas pasan su vida y nunca se casan, se la pasan en las casas limpiando y cuidando niños. Good evening. I would like to ask if you've done or if you know about any research or investigations about domestic workers that like uh, do not have children and they spend their whole lives working at the homes. Y um, esto es muy triste porque allí en San Antonio conozco muchas trabajadoras que se van a quedar en un convento de monjas y ellas nunca se casaron, ya son bien viejitas nunca tuvieron su propia vida porque solamente vivieron la vida de los niños que cuidan y de la casa que limpian. Um, and this is very sad, and I know a lot of women in San Antonio who like, um, have spent their whole lives working at their houses and they never had their own children because they spend their whole life taking care of someone else's children. Incluso uh, los domingos o días de fiesta, hasta llevan a los niños a, a, allí al, al lugar, porque ni siquiera los padres en ese, en ese fines de semana cuidan a los niños, se los llevan y los tienen ahí con ellas. Y también hay veces que algunas hasta se los llevan al cuarto a donde se quedan el fin de semana, que es su día de descanso, para cuidar a los niños. Uh, and even on like Sundays on holidays, uh, they take those children from the other houses with them and they even stay with them at the place where they stay uh, because their parents do not take care of them. Y a mí me gustaría saber si ya hubo una clase de estudio de eso o si se podría, eso es lo que a mí me gustaría en San Antonio que se hiciera una investigación. ¿A qué grado esas mujeres son esclavas? que pierden su propia vida y su propia dignidad por la de los patrones y los hijos de los patrones. Y lo peor de todo es que lo hacen de generación en generación porque terminan cuidando a los hijos, a los nietos de estas personas. So I would like to know if there's uh, already any research around these issues and, um, and, and to what extent they are slaves and how they lose their own lives um, because of the relationships they have with these children or with, the, um, with their bosses too. And I would like to know that here in San Antonio, where I, where I witnessed that. The, one of the panels tomorrow on transnational um, mm -hmm. uh, issues will be touching on, on uh, live-in maids mm -hmm. uh, abroad. I think in, in the United States, most of us have focused on uh, day workers simply because it's much more difficult to gain access to live-in domestic workers for the reasons that you just mentioned, because they're constantly working. And um, uh, tomorrow we'll hear from um, uh, Raquel, we'll, and, and she's managed to do a lot of her interviews by finding those places where domestic workers, uh, live in domestic workers meet on their day off. And um, I think that, you know, if that situation uh, is the same here, I'm not aware of it, but it seems like most of the live-in maids here, if they do have a day off, they go home to be with their families or their friends, and so they, they're, um, they've developed a, a community that doesn't force them to have to meet in a, a public area as they do in, um, in the Middle East and, and, and throughout the world in other countries. So I think it's, it, it's, it just becomes an issue of trying to find those women because they're simply not accessible they're really hidden behind doors. So my name is Claire Hobden. I work with the International Labor Organization on domestic work, and formerly in a past life with Domestic Workers United here in New York. Um, and so we've talked about uh, scholarship and um, the state of the arts, uh, past and present. 
I was wondering what your thoughts were about what is the next step, what's the future, where, what, what are you all, what are you each looking towards now? Well, certainly one of the areas is, is starting to, as mentioned before, is documenting, um, organizing strategies. Um, and tomorrow you'll be hearing from Peggy Smith, who's done wonderful work um, in terms of the law and sort of legally looking at those issues. And I think probably another issue that's going to come up in the law is, is how to enforce um, the Domestic Workers' Bill of Rights. Uh, because if you don't have political muscle behind that, you've got a law, but it has to be enforced. Um, so there's going to be some logistics there. So I suspect that that's going to be an important research issue in the future. And one thing that I think is important is to place what we're learning about the history of domestic workers and domestic work in conversation what is the new history of capitalism and its transformation. Because sometimes in history, there's so many silos. Uh, and I think it's uh, those of us who are historians uh, by trade, uh, we have a responsibility to transform the narratives. And rather than domestic work being a little paragraph about in labor history or a little paragraph here and there uh, with uh, the history of slavery, we need to put it at the center of our narratives. Uh, and that means not neglecting it when we move to talking about these macro forces, because it's so central. I would say for myself, um, I'm looking at how individuals create what they call in sociology, I'm trying to think of Billingsley and others, opportunity screens, and how at in my case, churches and community centers, community-based organizations, mm -hmm. getting people to understand the importance of household service work and ways of documenting it, and for me, control, getting people to understand what they have, how to reproduce it and keep it. Um, and I'm thinking of a person like, as a famous gospel singer, Richard Smallwood, where his mother and grandmother have a fabulous personal collection of materials and helping people learn how to mine what they have in their homes and their churches. And for me, it's not always giving it over to a big organization, but how do you keep it, maintain it, and let it continue to be your voice that's, that's heard in the broader community. So I'm uh, Linda Olikan, the overall coordinator of Damayan, organizing Filipino domestic workers here in New York. So I... I would like to thank you uh, personally, the panel, and the other uh, scholars and researchers here, and of course the sponsors and organizers of the conference. Personally, I'm so inspired that you know this, uh, you know, intellectual power will help us at the grassroots in uh, moving the work, in really um, winning what the uh, what workers deserve. So uh, I'm very excited about the pl uh, panels tomorrow. And my question is, uh, as scholars uh, that study histories and movements, uh, uh, in your opinion, what has been the greatest uh, victory of the women workers movement here in the US? And what was the main strategy employed? My, my second question is because uh, we're migrant workers from the Philippines. We frame ourselves as migrant workers because we didn't come here voluntarily. We came here because of work. So, and we see that we're going home we're not, when we're, we are not productive anymore. So uh, I'm very excited about changing the narrative that migration is uh, voluntary, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, and so uh, <laughs> uh, how do you uh, connect you know, the exploitation of women, migrant domestic workers to capitalism and to our shared analysis now that capitalism is inherently uh, exploitative and hopefully on the decline. So where do we see the connection in our struggle? Thank you.
hi, I feel so privileged to be here. Um, my name is Faith Wiggins, and um, I'm the director of the 1199 Home Care Education Fund. <coughs> um, and uh, Francis is telling me I must say I'm a Barnard alum, class of 84. Uh, <laughs> so I guess this is a comment, um, and I'm trying to say it in a way that doesn't get me in trouble back in the office. <laughs> um, and it's really that while, you know, we, 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 it seems that we framed this issue of domestic workers um, and bifurcated kind of the organized labor employed workforce from, you know, those that are not employed in the traditional way. But the comment I have listening to um, the things I've heard tonight and understanding um, uh, some of what the issues are for the domestic workforce that's not unionized, that's not employed in the same, you know, traditional way is that the struggles are so very much the same. Uh, the things that happen in the home, the requests that are inappropriate, mm -hmm. the, the, you know, workers who clock out and then go back uh, to take care of their uh, mm -hmm. patients, clients, um, you know, just there are many, many, many similarities, and I don't want us to lose sight that the workers here who are doing personal care, home care, and housekeeping work, working for an agency or for an individual employer, they're still the, the working poor. And yes, while, you know, thank goodness to labor unions like SEIU and 1199, there are health benefits, there's pension benefits, there's education benefits, and other things that have been hard fought and won. Um, the day-to-day -day labor and what that looks and feels like is still very, very much similar to um, you know, our brother and sisters who are here in the same struggle. I just want to call your attention to a researcher who is here that has been doing extensive um, research on international uh, strategies of organizing, and that's Jennifer Fish in the uh, back there. Yeah. And so there is one who's currently working in your midst. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say that the, um, it, I think it is good to look at some of the international uh, connections and also the ways in which the American system is, is very different uh, from other systems. And, and so to look at some of these other models um, in terms of uh, worker laws and uh, organizing, um, the U.S. has never signed on to the ILO's uh, Convention on mm -hmm. Domestic Workers, for right. example. Yeah. I don't know. Um, yeah, I think we, we and I don't know, like one other like horrible country, which I can't remember. No, well, in fact, it, it's a very new convention, but it doesn't sign on to any of them. It doesn't sign on to any of yeah. them, but um, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. a lot of countries have signed on to it so that there are Fourteen. both um, coverage by, in other words, covering domestic workers by the same laws that, are, that cover other workers, but also having other special protections because of the special conditions. I mean, I think that, that, that needs to be looked at. I think the California model in terms of um, home care worker organizing is actually uh, very interesting because that involved um, a uh, coalition between care receivers, the families of care receivers, uh, you know, caregivers, and creating a, a kind of um, employer of record, which would be uh, these different county agencies. So that allowed uh, for, or, you know, um, the unions within the kind of U.S. context, which cannot be done without uh, a, uh, an employer of, of record. So even though people, um, you know, care, care receivers employ caregivers directly, nonetheless, their paycheck comes through the, uh, these um, county agencies, and therefore the union can um, sign contracts with, with uh, these agencies. I guess some, uh, Eileen's not Well, so because too. of Harris v. Quinn, yeah. uh, the, the Supreme Court, uh, Jen Klein and I had a piece in the, in recently in Feminist Studies in which we argued that one of the big ironies right now is that the Supreme Court made the kind of many of the strategies for personal attendance uh, that you were talking about uh, 
not going to work, that, that, that somehow uh, it's going to be very difficult. But we can take hope in some of the Bill of Rights, particularly the one in Massachusetts, which, not, which goes beyond anything. And it, uh, the, even the ILO convention, it has the ILO recommendations. So there, what I take away from all of this is that we need broad-based coalition politics between those people who work in the home and those people who are outside of the home, between those people who are in the same sector but have different kinds of employers. And we have to remember that a migrant worker doesn't lose their identities or their connections to the place they came from just because they come here. And that there is such transfer of knowledge and we need a transnational approach, even for the national. I would say that uh, there, as they've said, there's a reciprocal support network that people have that for, in my case, African American women that have allowed them to create an undergirding and that this bridge of bent backs over which I, I, and I can get personal, I came, it makes a big difference in understanding um, history as an important part of what you do in terms of your uh, people and archivists and others. But I also think that it requires new frameworks, new paradigms, and that you just can't take what is established history and impose it on women and work and laborers that you have to be bold and daring enough to say this, this is a square form and everything about my experience has been round. So I don't have to force it in there that I can create this new way of understanding labor and work and progress and it is legitimate. It, um, it, it's not going to come uh, through, possibly through established uh, networks and mechanisms, and that's okay. That worker and labor's history, worker and labor history, particularly African American and workers, migrants, home health care, home health care, all these other new paradigms are legitimate, and that it, 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 it means that new models are demanded, and that the models aren't going to come the easy way, mm -hmm. that it's imperative that you stand strong and feel that what you're doing is important and that its importance in time will come forward. It, it will come forward, even if it's not now or, and that others don't recognize it. And I go back to so many other pamphlets and other historical studies that have been done, that are there. Um, from, I'm thinking Mary McLeod Bethune and others, they have a whole collection in the Bethune archives, which the National Park Service just out of hand moved out of her home. I'd love to see them move the Jefferson records from Monticello. <laughs> it wouldn't be stood for. But they moved all that worker's history. And it was this sense, oh, well, just, it can go somewhere else. So it's that attitude. But, um, as activists, this is absolutely what people are up against. Exactly. Well, I would just like to remind us how we started. We, our panel was preceded by comments from Lydia um, Katina Amaya which were quite moving and quite um, insightful in terms of reminding us both how far we've come and how far we still need to go. Um, so I would like to just end by thanking the National Domestic yes. Workers Association Alliance for the kind of work that you've been doing because her story could have ended differently um, as so many generations of women before her stories ended so differently. Um, so thank you for the work that you've done, and thank you, Linda, for bringing together this group of scholars and activists. Thank you.